Hi, welcome to the Art Lecture Series Winter Quarter. Welcome everyone. Glad that you are here and can make it. Um, my name is Shah Osha. I coordinate this series. And I just want to remind us that the Evergreen State College is situated on the ceded territories of the Medicine Creek Treaty Tribes, which include the Squaxin Island Tribe, the Nisqually Indian Tribe, and the Puyallup Tribe of Indians. Um, and I want to um, take us to the website for the art lecture series and show you what's coming up for this quarter. Um, so here's the, our website. Um, on the home page here, you have the whole quarter's worth of lectures. And just to remind you that we invite a broad range of um, artists, writers, activists, scholars um, from a range of interdisciplinary approaches to contemporary art issues. We consider that a, as um, sort of an enlarged arena um, and that it is an exchange of ideas. So we encourage students, faculty, the community to engage with the, our, our guests that we invite here. So please uh, engage at the end of the talk with your questions and responses. And you can do that by raising your hand, your virtual hand and asking, which is the preferred method so that we can hear your voices. You also can type questions in to the Q and A. Um, so for winter quarter today, we are thrilled to have be another lab that we were scheduled to be with them last quarter and they couldn't make that. So we're, they're here now. So we get a chance to hear from um, Marta and, and we'll do that in a moment. Week four, so it's every other week from 1130 to one week four, we have Patricia Vasquez Gomez. Um, who will be coming to us, who's out of Portland. Um, and then week six, we have Lauren Elisa Beerley, uh, an interdisciplinary artist coming from Brooklyn. And then week eight, we have Karina Aguilera Skversky, who's coming also from New York. Um, so we have a great lineup and um, sorry for all the scrolling. It, we also have a past lectures that go way back down to 20, I think 2011, that you can, um, we have links to in our video gallery are there, tells you who spoke that um, quarter and then a link to the actual um, lectures. So please um, go to that site and uh, we, it's full of fantastic talks. I want to thank at the beginning of this quarter, I just want to thank media services, Raul Berman, Dave Crampton, Vito Valera, and the student media interns for helping us um, with these Zoom presentations in particular, making the recordings. It's, it, we couldn't do it without you. And then for Julie Ron for helping with um, some of the administrative duties. And now I would like to. I'm very grateful to Selena Kearney, a student who will introduce the another lab. Hi, Titch Katachi. My name is Selena Kearney. My mothers were Teresa Rosander and Janice Flatch. My grandmother is Ida Rosander, I'm a proud member of the Chehalis tribe. And I'm also a student in a program here at Evergreen um, titled Ampersand, Hybridity in the Visual and Narrative Arts. We are practicing in our program, locating the other through art. I'm honored to introduce Marte Rowell from Be Another Lab. The lab is a group of interdisciplinary interdis researchers that are combining art, science, and technology to investigate innovative approaches to storytelling and experimentation with the nature of the self and others. The lab's projects include an ambitious embodied virtual reality system to explore the world from another's perspective, including a body and gender swap that allows users to swap their embodied perspective that puts the meaning of gender in the forefront for the participants. Be Another Lab also uses VR technology to swap bodies and experience the stories and perspectives of another. The Machine to Be Another has toured over 100 locations in over 30 countries and attended by, by more than 5,000 participants. 
In our increasingly digital world, I'm grateful for the effort to use VR technology as a tool to practice radical empathy. And I'm honored to welcome our guest from Be Another Lab today. Thanks. Hello, thank you, Selena, for that uh, wonderful introduction. And the honor is really mine to have such an introduction and such a great uh, group of people around me. And so I will uh, start my screen sharing. So today I'll be very um, broadly talking about the work that we do at Be Another Lab. And I say broadly because I will actually talk about a bit of everything, a bit about science, society, and also about some of our projects. And I know that uh, we are a bit tired of Zoom and it would be much nicer to sit together in a room, but this is what we have at the moment. And I hope to make it as close as possible. And anyways, I will begin by introducing our group. And as Selena said, we work in the intersection of several fields and I will even include a few others. So it's art, science, society, technology, and activism. Pretty much everything there is, but it will become a little bit more clear in a moment. And we are based all over the place, mostly in Barcelona, Sao Paulo and Zurich, but we have collaborators around the world in the US and in Mexico, in Germany, and in, in many different places around the world. Um, we, we work across time zones and across disciplines, across cultures. We don't have a real base, though Barcelona is where we started. And besides the, what Selena said, we try to reinvent technologies to contrast the alienation that is often promoted by technoscience. So it's, I don't like to use the term innovation so much because it also implies, implies uh, getting old and, and obsolete. So I, I think reinventing is a good way to, to term it. And I will now, before continuing with the work that we do, I want to go back a bit because I will actually start my introduction with a bit of the science and perhaps philosophy and reflections around this idea of embodying others, a machine to be another. But first I want to start with this paper that was published um, a bit over a decade ago. And the title, well, it was published in this big uh, uh, journal, Science. And for those of you that are not, uh, uh, perhaps don't know much about how the scientific uh, economy works, it, it's a lot about publishing and, and basically if you publish in science, it's a very big deal. And uh, so the fact that this paper was published in science is quite illustrative of a shift in mindset, I guess, because it's talking about certain things that some time ago could have been perceived as esoteric almost. And it's talking about the evidence for a collective intelligence factor in the performance of human groups. And what is interesting is that the things that they found uh, to correlate, that correlate with uh, collective intelligence are not at all what we tend to promote in our world and including this uh, very monological presentation that I'm giving. So the interesting thing is that it's uh, correlated with the average social, average social sensitivity of the group, the, uh, the distribution of turn-taking in the conversation, so no monologues, for example, and the proportion of females in the group with the higher number of females resulting in, a, in more collective intelligence. So what is interesting is that all the spaces that we build around knowledge production don't seem to follow these, um, these uh, ideas. So I, even though this will be a very monological presentation because of the setting that we are in and, and the Zoom context, I do want to call our attention on that. And, and hopefully new technologies will become as prominent that allow us to have a different type of conversation online. And now I will start talking uh, about our project by reflecting on body boundaries. And normally I would ask this as a question for the audience, but today it will be more of a reflection because it's not so easy to have uh, uh, the questions during the talk, but only uh, at the end. Um, but feel free to write them and, and keep them in mind if you have them so that you can come back, we can come back to them. And 
My question or the reflection, and I will give you a few seconds to think about this is, what are the objective limits of our bodies? So let's say when we go to the doctor, which we maybe consider an authority in terms of, you know, the, the knowledge that they have about the human body, what is it that they consider a body, a human body? What is it that constitutes it? And let's have a very scientific mind on this. And what could it be that defines the limits of a human body? And you can just think about it. I'm sure some of you have some answers already or some thoughts. And maybe some of these are the spatial body, the spatial limits of the body, you know, where, where my body ends. But not only is our, body, our, our bodies in constant movement, our dynamic, the living body tends to be dynamic. And, but also, for example, I have on the right side, um, the longest beard ever recorded that was above, to, uh, what, sorry, I use the metric system, but that, that's about six feet or, or bigger than that. Um, and this you can actually visit in the Smithsonian Museum, and it's uh, been turning yellow over the years. And the question would be, would you consider that that man's beard part of his body? And we have Stellar here on the middle with an implanted ear in the arm. And would you consider that part of the body? And then we have also a prosthesis of all sorts that uh, really make us again question, is it really the spatial boundaries that are, are part of our bodies that, that are, uh, yeah, the, the, the spatial aspect that separates our body from the rest and the environment. Another possible answer would be genetic constraints, no? It could be that our bodies are, are genetic, uh, you know, our DNA. And however, it turns out that we have a lot of cells that are not ours. And in this study that I cite on the left, we have uh, that in a study, they found that 63% of the 59 women that they tested harbored male cells in their brains. This may be because of their, of their, uh, the babies that they had, you know, they keep these cells, but also we have so many microbes. And, you know, if you've heard about uh, fecal transplants, this is quite a fascinating therapy that is basically inserting another person's biome into your own body. So it's difficult to define ourselves objectively, even if we think in genetic terms. And lastly, the environment organ organism distinctions. Uh, and he, I have here on the right side, an image of uh, cell, um, mirror touch synesthesia, which is actually, a, yeah, it's a type of synesthesia where people report feeling the touch that they see on others. And it turns out that it's, you know, it's not that rare. I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it's, uh, if I'm correct, over one in a hundred. So probably one of us in this uh, uh, meeting have this. And I, in my opinion, though this hasn't been proven, this is something that can even be trained, that you can learn to feel the touch on, others people, on other people. And uh, on the left side, I'm not going to get into the, the image in detail, but I, I think if you think of, of gravity as, a, as something that is necessary for our development, which is a problem in space travel, because if we want to have generations of humans that are not born in these gravitational conditions, odds are that this won't work out. We need gravity. And um, this is an important part of the development of our muscles, our bones, and our whole bodily system. So um, even if we think on this distinction, it's very difficult to, to come to a, to a strict separation. And then we have cases, for example, like Tatiana and Krista Hogan, uh, these Canadian co-joint twins that are joined by the thalamus, which is a, a brain area that is often associated with, uh, with the senses. So this is, let's say, the sensory input of, of the brain. And what happens is that they actually share a bit of the experience of each other. So one can see through the eyes of the other, literally. They can sense the touch on the other person's body. Yet they have very different personalities, very different characters. So uh, this, again, puts uh, this uh, very eternal question of the body and the self and the mind. What is it that distinguishes the body and the mind? Is it really the same thing? 
And um, I think in thinking about these things in, in this way, we start to find that they are much more liquid than we thought of. It's not as static and the body turns out to be this very dynamic thing that is in constant morphing, that is in constant um, the, uh, yeah, melting with the world. And then we have on the right side, uh, phantom limbs, which is probably a phenomenon that you've all heard about that people uh, that have amputations or even people that were born without the limb uh, report feeling a phantom. So, um, you know, these ideas are just maybe to start thinking on, on this issue of the body and the self. And I will not give any answers today, but hopefully these questions will be encouraging and, and at least mystify the topic a little bit, which is really fascinating. So now, from what I said, we can gather that the body has no intrinsic meaning, right? Populations create their own meanings and thus their own bodies. So not only is our body malleable, but also what we think of our body. And it's quite crucial that we have a concept of the body, right? Because it's the, our main interface with the world, with others, and it's such an important part of our whole thing. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, uh, I think it's good to keep this in mind. And now, you, not only in terms of the body, but if you start thinking or, or what we generally think of the body, but at a very simple organism level, you've probably heard of mirror neurons. And what happens with mirror neurons, they were discovered a few decades ago. And what it was actually a serendipity. It, it wasn't planned to discover these neurons. But what happened was that they realized that these monkeys that had some uh, electrodes connected to their brains, to the premotor area of their brains, had some activity that was, uh, yeah, it acted, this area activated or these neurons activated not only when the, the monkey perf performed an action himself or herself, but also when the, the investigator, the researcher performed that action. So at a certain level of brain processing, there was no distinction between the self and the other. We were one or we are one at a certain level of the brain. And this is also quite fascinating and inspiring and a lot of pop science developed from it. And it was also inspiring for us in the team. And um, there are many mirror-like neurons and areas in human brains as well. And whoop, how bizarre would it be to, well, I missed that slide, but to conceive an eye without the we, that was one of the quotes from Rizzolatti, which is one of the researchers that discovered it, these neurons. And um, at large, these talks or questions, this idea of self-other merging and distinction, we are often merging with others, but also we have to distinguish ourselves from others, right? And this is an important aspect of empathy. We, we need to know where the emotions originate and it's unsustainable to just feel and emote with everything that happens around us. So despite this ambiguous line between the self and others, however, that, you know, it turns out that at a very fundamental scientific level, there is no, not a clear distinction between the self and others. However, we tend to make very uh, big distinctions. And this is a study from also last decade that shows, uh, I will just exemplify it now for illustration. What they showed is that by, um, so let's say I go into the laboratory and I go with someone that I've never before seen in my life. And they start threatening that person with a needle on the finger and they, they scan both of her brains. And then my mom comes into the lab and they do the same thing and they threaten her with a needle and they scan both of her brains. And it turns out that the, there is a lot of conjunction of what is happening when I see the threat on my mom, but not when I, when I see the threat on someone that I don't know. So it turns out that familiarity is an important aspect for blurring the self and the other. And they did this other study where um, they show that people with a certain skin color, people with light skin color would have less empathy to people with uh, dark skin, but not if the, the uh, and these were not actually people in terms of, you know, an identity. It was just seeing a hand that had that skin tone. And um, 
the, when, when they saw a hand that was purple, there wasn't this reduction. So only when there was this difference. So that's quite impressive that we would even empathize more with a skin color that doesn't exist. Of course, this is culturally bound and, and science is at large. So uh, we shouldn't consider this as unmovable. This study was performed in Italy. And then on the other hand, we also make these type of distinctions of others and ourselves, and we make walls all over the place. And this seems to be a very big political trend. And it, hasn't, it has been this way also for a long time. Hopefully it will not for long. But uh, so it, it's quite crazy, no? Despite the fact that we are just each other in a way, we are making these distinctions. So in Be Another Lab, uh, we started working about 10 years ago on this question, which maybe many of us have thought, how would the world be like if we could see from the eyes of others? Would we better be able, be able to better understand ourselves and each other as part of a collective? And we started working with different technologies and playing around with, uh, yeah, just uh, some of the science that we found from an artistic perspective. And, and I'll tell you more about it in a moment. But before I want us to think about body boundaries again, but this time the subjective limits of our bodies. And perhaps if we think on this way, uh, it's easier to find, to know what is part of our body and what is not, right? Like I, I'm grabbing this cup right now and I can, I know that it's not part of my body, but as soon as the water comes into my body, it is part of my body. And this is just a, a sort of an intuitive subjective sensation. And I know that when you touch me on the finger, I feel the touch, but if you touch the cup, I don't. So you've probably heard of this rubber hand illusion. And if not, I will just explain quickly. You see on the left, a person that has a hand in front, right? A rubber hand, but that person cannot see their own hand, correct? Um, uh, this, uh, their own hand is covered by a wall. And on the other hand, we have the experimenter that is touching that person's rubber hand, but also their own hand simultaneously. And I'll show you what happens after a while. So stroking both of the hands simultaneously. Okay, so there was this experimenter that threatened the rubber hand and the participant had a reaction on their own hand, right? This means that the participant was tricked into believing that that hand was their own, okay? So what happened here, there was a synchrony of the, the tactile, expect the visual expectation of touch. So, you know, there was a congruency because between what the touch was telling that person and what vision was telling that person. And that's a way to elicit this type of illusions. And there are many others. The rubber hand illusion has been replicated many, many times. Recently, it's been questioned. I will talk a little bit about it. I actually have a lot of content, so I hope there's enough time. And I also look forward to the questions. There's another study from, from, uh, that followed this one that is a full body illusion. And what happened here is that we have on the left-hand side uh, a camera that is filming a participant and the participant is seeing on a virtual reality headset what the camera is feeding so what the participant is seeing is their own back in front of them right and somebody strokes their own back and they see the, their back being stroked in front of them but they feel it on their own back and what this creates is the sense that they are located in front of them it's sort of an uh, um, out of body illusion or an autoscopy. They, they feel that they perceive themselves outside of their own body boundaries. And this is very easy to test. You can do it if you have some VR headsets and some webcam uh, in the university or at home, you can test with somebody else. And you can see that after a while, it's this strange sensation. It's not necessarily like the, if any of you have had uh, out of body illusions, but it does create this uh, strange feeling of, self-location and, and yeah, I mean, I, hopefully you'll get to test ones. And studies like this have been replicated many times and we have uh, had uh, invisible hand illusions, having two right hands, having an invisible body that still feels, you know, you see, you look down and you see nothing. So I'm talking about the one on the right hand side, the invisible body condition. 
what the participants see is nothing, but basically, but they still feel there's somebody touching their, their belly and they feel on their own belly, the touch, but there is nothing there, okay? I don't know if that was clear. I, I will show some videos in a bit that might make it clear. So there are many ways to elicit these illusions uh, that show this plasticity of our subjective sense of body. So not only objectively, but also subjectively, it's quite malleable, right? We can transform ourselves and our bodies. We also have this enfacement illusion, which is uh, similar to the mirror touch synesthesia that I mentioned before. So what happens is that they see us in a mirror, a person uh, uh, allocentrically. So, so uh, yeah, from a third person perspective, they see a face and they are touched, for example, on the cheek. And they see the touch happening simultaneously on the face that they see. And this creates uh, this cell uh, sense of, uh, well, there are many things that, that happen. There is a sense of merging with the other person, let's say. And there are many interesting studies about uh, these. And what is interesting about this is that a lot of the changes do not ha happen so strongly at the subjective level that, or at the level that participants can report, oh yeah, I felt that I, I was that person that I was seeing, but there are implicit changes. So you can see that actually some behaviors or some attitudes change after this. And I will talk about it a, a bit more in a moment. So what is happening in these cases? We have visual capture of touch and proprioception. So what the, you know, the vision is telling us something. It's giving us an expectation of what should happen, not only tactilely, but also proprioceptively or, or uh, in other sensory modalities, other senses. So there is a plausibility of the body, right? There's a prior knowledge about how a body looks like. So for example, they tried to do rubber hand illusions with, instead of using a hand, just using a box, a red box, let's say, and the illusion did not happen then. So there is importance on how the body looks and what we know about bodies. And if you're not convinced that this actually happens, it's quite surprising. You know, I, I would be quite skeptical myself. And I have to say it doesn't happen uh, strongly to everyone and it's not that it happens all the time but there are moments in which you're really like wait what is that is that what you're just confused and and you cannot even though you know it's not true there's a part of yourself that it's is telling you it is true so if you're not convinced the the way we we do it in science to to confirm that this is actually happening happening is by measuring physiological, behavioral, and also subjective changes. So physiological would be, for example, if I threaten the rubber hand, you would have an increased uh, skin conductance response, so sudoration on the skin or an increased heart rate. And we usually compare this with a control condition, which would be in this case, for example, touching the rubber hand asynchronously, so not at the same time as they touch the hand. And that would, that mismatch would not result in the illusion. We have also behavioral changes. So after doing these things, let's say there is this task in the rubber hand illusion, which is proprioceptive drift. Participants have to close their eyes and point at where they feel their hand is. And what happens is that they actually locate their hand closer to the hand that they are seeing. So the rubber hand than their own hand. And then the subjective changes are what participants report, what it feels like. And indeed, a lot of people report that it feels like the hand is their own. And there are many other ways to alter this bodily self-consciousness. And I will go through them quickly. So we have time to talk about the other interesting stuff. But um, so this was done with uh, body ownership of a, of a foreign hand. But you can do the uh, disownership of the own hand if you break the visual tactile expectation like you see here. So participants see their own hand in the headset, but they, they see it with a delay. So what they feel and what they see is different. And this creates a sense of disembodiment. It's a, it's a little bit strange. It feels like a numbness in a way. And you can try this also, it's quite simple to test. And we have this uh, visual motor coordination also helps. So no, no, not only feeling touch where the touch is expected visually, but also that the hand moves in a way that is expected, no? that you see a visual reaction to your movement. And the, the left-hand side is one of my favorite because it's such a, a smart solution, I think. 
what they put, do is put a, like a rubber uh, cloth, like certain cloth uh, on the top part of the box and they attach it with like a Q-tip or something to their own uh, finger so that when the participant moves the, the finger, the hand on the top would move. And this also creates a sensation that the hand on the top is their own hand. And you have several ways. I, I'm not gonna get into all of them, but on the uh, right-hand side, you have the, um, like the traditional virtual reality experience where you can actually move your virtual body and that creates this sense that the body is your own. You immediately self-identify with the body that you can move in a first person perspective. And I will, sorry, that's too loud. I will show you this video from our group where we also rely much on visual motor coordination, but really we use all the senses and I will get back to it uh, in a bit more detail in a moment. So what is interesting a bit about this case, whoops, sorry. What is interesting about the, this case, um, I'll go back to the previous slide, is that not only is there this sense of self-identification with the body, but there is this sense of agency, which is quite constitutive of this feeling of embodiment, the feeling that I have, that my actions have a consequence in the world or in my body. Uh, what is interesting here is that this is really merged, you know, and often participants report not knowing whether it was them performing the movement or the other person. There is this sense of also interbeing in terms of agency. It's a shared agency. And uh, what we ask participants is to see, move synchronously, to follow each other. So there's no leader and no follower. And quite quickly and organically, people start moving in uh, incredible synchrony uh, in a very choreographed way. So um, yeah, it's, uh, I like to think that that's almost more of a machine to be we or us than to be another. And then you can also do these body manipulations with sound. And I will, again, I mean, just as an overview, I will just mention one of the studies, uh, the one on the left, it's quite fascinating. Also a very smart, ingenious design 
what they did is that they had participants tap on a surface to tack, tack, tack. And you know, like uh, sound takes time to arrive to uh, somewhere, right? So the, the time it takes to arrive to the ear depends on how far the tapping is happening, right? So what they did was to delay the, the sound of the tapping and the participants reported feeling that uh, they had a longer elongation of the arm. So it's quite interesting that even then with sound, uh, we would be able to modulate the sense of body. And there was a recent study, uh, which is similar to the, the image on the center. The, what they did here was to just uh, do a frequency modulation of the footsteps. So your footsteps would even sound, you know, like more with lower or higher frequencies. And I guess people that, for example, have used high heels, you know, how maybe even the sound of the high heels makes you feel differently. I don't know if this is the case for you, uh, but uh, similarly here, people reported feeling differently depending on how this, their steps sound. And recently they showed that there is even a, a modulation of gender identity uh, depending on how you modulate these sounds. And I will skip the one on the right, but it's like an out of body experience with sound where participants, well, I'm not skipping it, sorry. <laughs> where participants hear their own selves or hear their own voice and walk, hear themselves walking around themselves. So in, in extra personal space. And even olfaction has shown to modulate the sense of body or embodiment. And here on the top, uh, there is a fun study that we did in, in a museum. And what happened was that we had participants see as if it was really a very playful experiment as if they were a grapefruit. So they saw from the perspective of a grapefruit, when they looked down, they just saw the grapefruit as you see in the image here, and they were pressed on their shoulders. And, and as they were seeing these, they were actually pressed on their own shoulders. And uh, they uh, simultaneously smelled either a grapefruit, the smell of grapefruit or the smell of strawberry. And it turns out that when the smell was congruent, so when they smelled the grapefruit, they had a, a stronger feeling that they were the grapefruit. And uh, see, uh, below we showed in a, we, we took, um, we synthesized uh, sweat, uh, sex sweat. So from males, male and, and female sweat. And uh, we had participants see from a, a gender that was the body, the body of a person from the sex that they were smelling. And when this was congruent, they had a stronger, stronger reactions to, uh, yeah, a, a measure that we use to test embodiment. I will not get into those details, but it seemed that even there it, it had an effect. Uh, this congruency of scent had an effect. And we have interoception on the other hand. So interoception is this, uh, is quite in a trendy topic in, in my field or, or in, in, you know, in this area. And it's a feeling or the, our senses that monitor what happens inside our body. So our capacity to, for example, feel our heart rate or our breathing, it's complicated philosophically to pack all of these senses into a single packet of interoception, but everything that tells us something about our, the inner state of our bodies. And even then they have shown that this can modulate the sense of body. And we have on the left, a, a very simple, also interesting illusion where participants do exercise and they have acoustic uh, feedback of their heart rate. And this is actually, when it's faster than their actual heart rate, they feel that they did more effort. Um, so uh, interesting studies, uh, uh, again, showing that our body is quite malleable. Now, some people have recently been saying that this is something like hypnosis, that we, we are saying that the rubber hand feels like our own because this is what the experimental constraints tell us to. However, I think, and this has gained a lot of attention recently. However, in my opinion, these solutions are related to clinical symptoms. So especially disembodiment or the feeling of not owning or feeling a distance or uh, the afference with the own body, that the body feels somehow distant or not fully belonging to us uh, is something that happens in quite a few clinical conditions. And they also occur in other species. So there's a rubber tail il illusion in mice, I, if I'm not mistaken, mistaken, or rats. So, you know, I, arguably they wouldn't be so uh, 
or, or they are too smart and just performing well, or, or yeah, I don't think they are doing it because the experimenter tells them to. So they, they also, on the other hand, have behavioral, cognitive, affective, and social impact. When we do these things, it does matter. It does shift how we feel about ourselves and others. And this is the next thing that I will talk about. But I know I don't have too much time before uh, the question round, so I will go a bit quickly here. But the idea is really that the body is our interface with the world and others. And if we are able to alter the way we feel about our body, we also change our relation to the world and others. And yeah, another video first, uh, showing just an overview of our work. This is uh, from 2014, so already quite old, but this was the vision back then of the work that we do. How far would someone go to understand the other? Would you be an immigrant? Would you change your gender? Would you dare to see yourself with physical disabilities. We've decided to hack neuroscience experiments to experience what it's like to be in the body of a different person. The Machine to be Another combines neuroscience protocols with art performances to trick the brain's perception of one's own body. Instead of seeing themselves in the body of a digital avatar, like in most of the neuroscience studies, the machine allows users to see themselves in the body of a real person. The protocol of interaction combines visual, audio, physical, and motor stimuli. More than an art installation, the Machine to be Another is a Creative Commons initiative that can be replicated by anyone interested in understanding the world through the eyes of the other, and therefore interested in understanding themselves. We developed several applications of the Machine to be Another addressing issues like mutual respect, gender identity, generational conflicts, immigration and physical disability bias, body extension and neurorehabilitation. And we are planning to go much further in this long-term research that aims to raise the awareness that we are more than individuals. We are part of a big system, a big collective called humanity. And have you ever imagined how would this world be like if we could understand better each other? So. I will skip this video for the sake of time, but you can see here that they did a, a, an illusion where the, this tall participant felt that he was embodied in a Barbie doll. And uh, what happens then is that not only do they feel embodied there, but the, the way the dimensions of the world are perceived changes. So they felt that small objects were huge. And this happened only when the touch on the foot was synchronous with what they saw. So we also have this one, this is quite, uh, I, I, I'm talking about the, the study on the right. It's quite fascinating. I, I would be a bit cautious with these findings because they're a little bit extreme, but they show that after participants embodied Einstein, they felt that they were, uh, well, they actually performed better in a cognitive test in like a, you know, a sort of IQ test. They had a better performance feeling that they were Einstein. So that's as extreme as we could go. But again, I, I would consider these findings with caution. But there are some very robust studies that have shown that these uh, manipulations actually change the self-concept. In this study, this, uh, it's a friend study. Pairs of friends went to the lab and they did a, a body swap. And they actually started feeling more like their own, their friends. Like they, they started attributing qualities that they attributed to their friends to themselves. And similarly, there have been sh shifts in gender identity towards a more neutral identity after doing a gender swap. And this also affects memory and several other things. This, uh, I will pause this video at a certain point to show you what is happening. So participants come into the lab and they see a girl that is crying and, and needs to be comforted. And the participants start saying um, comforting statements to the girl. It's not nice when things happen to us that we don't like. It's really upset you, hasn't it? What happens next is that participants are put in the perspective of the girl and they see themselves saying the comforting statements to themselves. Mm -hmm. 
you know sometimes when we're sad it's really and this sad. has actually had a, a quite a positive clinical impact in patients with depression in terms of self-compassion and depressive symptoms and um i i think you can imagine how powerful it must be to see yourself being comforted by your adult self or your, your child self being comforted by your adult self and there's also uh, several studies showing a decrease in, in racial bias in uh, after embodying a different skin body for participants that had a racial bias initially that had a strong racial bias initially and uh, e even increases in outgroup uh, like this is in the context of israel palestine they showed a, an increase with this motor mimicry that they they saw in a mirror like fashion um, a Palestinian Israeli saw a Palestinian moving in synchrony with them. And this had an increase in, in empathy towards that Palestinian specifically, but not to the out group of Palestinians at large. So it is quite interesting also to study the limits and limitations of these studies. And of course, and I will talk more about it, not only think that the technology is the solution. Now I will briefly go through the work that we do in Be Another Lab, and I think we will be in good time for the question round. And we have, uh, it's mostly a methodology that we have. The Machine to Be Another is a methodology that uh, helps people to embody others, but it's also very much a participative design methodology that I will go into detail. But we usually start with three principles or techniques that we have seen that work and they are our main tools uh, for action and I will mention them briefly and tell you more or less how they are built. And we started, uh, as I said, 10 years ago, roughly doing neuroscience in the garage. We started plugging all the uh, broken webcams and headsets uh, from the 90s, virtual reality headsets from the 90s. We started plugging all of these and playing around and we realized that there was something very powerful here and that it could be much lower cost than what was accessible back then. Now we have a lot of uh, much lower cost devices that make it easier to ourselves. And the platforms that we developed were first this traditional machine to be another. And what we have on the right side is a performer that has a robotic camera on the chest, attached to the chest. And this robotic camera feeds the point of view of the performer. And when the participant who is sitting on the left side looks down, the robot camera would look down. So the participant has full agency of the head movements from the performer's perspective. And then the performer can follow, can rotate the head as you see Norma here on the right side, uh, looking to, to the right, she can follow the movements of the participant. So that way she can also move as a participant and the participant would thus feel that he is embodying Norma. Now, uh, another important thing of this, and, and uh, uh, not in the body swap or gender swap that I showed before, but in this setting is that we combine it with narrative. So we actually recorded a story of Norma that had different moments, and we play back these moments according to the participants' actions. So for example, now we have two facilitators that are coming with a mirror towards them, and what happens then is that uh, the participant can see himself in the mirror as if he was Norma. So not only the first person perspective, but also in the mirror. And there are two facilitators that come so that the, they can both touch the mirror, for example. And that way, as you saw, this would enhance the feeling that they're embodying the other person. And th this way we can really use all the senses that we uh, have and can imagine. And uh, what I was telling about the stories, the storytelling part is really Norma talking about herself. It's, uh, and we trigger this in key moments. So in this image, you don't see it, but we usually not, for example, when the mirror would come, the participant would hear, my name is Norma, I was born here, and this is my story, for example. But then maybe there's a, a few personal objects from the performer's life that are located around both of them. So for example, if the participant decides to grab one of them, say the smartphone, then he would hear a story about the smartphone or that personal object. 
I will skip this video, but on the other hand, we have the body swap, which you saw already, which allows two participants to mutually exchange perspectives. And we have combined uh, these uh, uh, also with narratives. So not only do you see from the other's perspective, but also hear a story. But yeah, this is uh, mostly we use it as a very somatic experience, just as an embodied practice that really is quite uh, impressive at, uh, at its capacity to foster intimacy and uh, closeness, I think. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite a fascinating experience. I still love to do it every time that I can. And then lastly, we have this, uh, uh, the library of ourselves, which is our most recent project, which has a participant and a facilitator. And we pre-record movies from uh, another person's perspective. Then these movies include touch. So a first person perspective movie where the, the first person body is interacting with other things in the environment. And then we replicate what happens in the environment uh, uh, in this setting. So it's also, it, all of our works have this performative as aspect, uh, which we consider quite crucial, not only because of this live embodied practice and the power of human touch, but also because it opens up a space for conversation and dialogue. And as I said, for us, the technology is not much more than a tool. And it really is important how we accompany this experience, how we bring, how we give a certain context and, and setting to this experience, how we open a space for conversation, dialogue, exchange, and questioning. And I think that's basically our methodology. Uh, and well, not, not all of it, I will talk about the most important part, but, but this performative part is quite crucial. And of this one, I will show you a video because it's what we've been uh, putting mo most of our effort in the past few years. So this is, for example, how we, we would um, uh, film from someone's perspective. We have these helmets that we develop. We use uh, uh, these cameras to have a first person perspective. We live in a world surrounded by walls, physical, political, subjective, intergroup walls. But what if we could build a door that allowed us to travel through these walls? A machine that could let us see through the eyes of the others, no matter who or where they are. That would let us feel in their shoes, moving and touching with their hands and bodies as we listen to their perspectives. would like to introduce the library of ourselves, a virtual reality station based on the machine to be another that offers participants an archive of VR films recorded in first person and experienced through eyes, ears and body. Designed as an autonomous tool that can be installed in cultural, social and educational environments, the Library of Ourselves helps participants know more about the life of migrants from wars, climate change or extreme poverty seeking for asylum, of communities socially vulnerable, of local Europeans facing new inhabitants, of common citizens facing everyday life, and many other stories. By combining cognitive science protocols with VR and documentary filmmaking techniques, these films can be experienced by pairs of participants who alternate between the role of user and guide, and who, together, can engage into a deeper reflection about the experiences. Each station also allows users to experience the body swap Okay, I will skip the second part, which you know. And so you see a bit of, of, the, of the library of ourselves. And now the, the part that is quite important is that we develop these things with the people that are sharing their stories. And this is really a co-production. And the people that are sharing this, their stories have full agency over what they say and how they want to say it. We basically give uh, our expertise in terms of the tools that we have and the uh, techniques. And uh, we like to 
generally show them the experiences so they have a first-hand experience and and then they can see the power of it and why the the what we have discovered is uh, important what are you know we give some advice in terms of what we have seen that works and what doesn't for this embodiment but then we really create this uh, uh, every time with the people and often in very uh, scarce conditions so we we have yeah we have to figure it out in under very tight time constraints also financial constraints but i will uh, go through a, a few of the projects that we have done over the past years this is just a small selection of them but i will show you so this performance from 2013, we had a, an art residency somewhere in Spain and we were working with Sara and Sara was a teenage girl that was having some conflicts with her mom. And she was often going to this cultural center and she asked, she, she wanted to share something with her mom. So we together developed this experience where Sara liked to draw and, and she actually drew with her mom. She, her mom saw from Sarah's perspective as she drew and both of them drew together and and what was very beautiful not I mean not only these was beautiful but they also get, got in touch a few months after saying that this experience had been very powerful in in bringing them together in a period of conflict um, so that's an example then here's another one So you can see here, um, uh, again, we work with this, uh, we started working with this dance company, uh, uh, people in wheelchairs, and together we developed this performance with another dancer. And this was a complete choreography developed by the two dancers. And we, of course, brought uh, up this machine to be another into place. And you can see clearly the resolution of the image. This was, the, I think, 2000. 13 and we were using analog video and even this headset is is wireless which is quite surprising because it's a very old headset uh, if i'm correct it's from the 90s and it was wireless and, and only digital technology is putting up to, uh, to date only now so i will go to the next uh, slide for time but you can see all of our videos on vimeo we have several and you can just explore there vimeo.com slash be another lab so this, you, you probably saw an image of this in a previous video as well, but this is a project that we worked with a group of Muslim activists living in, in Barcelona, and uh, they all shared their experiences with Islamophobia, and together they developed this uh, very powerful VR content. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's really well done and very powerful. And what is interesting about this one is that though we generally don't work with fiction these and and well we have a few cases in which people have developed stories based on their own story so so they sort of develop this fictional character that goes through many of the experiences that hey, they have gone through in the city and then we perform this in the ramblas for example after there was this uh, um, 
attack a few years ago. And it's, you know, VR has this power of people feeling, you know, oh yeah, it's VR, I'm gonna try it on. And then they enter this very vulnerable space, which they didn't expect. No, they're probably expecting a first person shooter game or something like that. And often people that wouldn't go through these experiences otherwise is willing to do it because of the te technology. So in that way, it's a powerful tool uh, to convey certain messages. We work with, uh, uh, in the context of immigration in Argentina as well, a few years ago, this is with Hanin, uh, um, the first Syrian refugee that arrived with the, the refugee program to Argentina. And she talks about her experience as well. This is a story. <clears throat> uh, this is one of my favorites is uh, Jonah, a transgender man from the Netherlands that just talks about his everyday life, basically with his friends, the trans uh, and, and also work colleagues and, and his partner who is here on the image. And, and it's just such a loving story that of commonality of, you know, like just a person that wants what we all want in a way you know and um yeah it's a very touching very uh, beautiful uh, content then we worked this one is also uh, it was very interesting we work with children in the north of mexico in a community in durango that is very um yeah it's a very crazy context not only it's is it in the middle of the drug the golden triangle of the sinaloa cartel but also there's a lot of mining there. There are a lot of, uh, in, yeah, it's, it's a really a, a very interesting context. And what we had it was we worked with children in, in developing stories of what they would like to do if they were the people in power, let's say, if they were the rulers, if were, they were the governors, the, the presidents, what would they do? And they developed these stories that then they shared from a first person perspective to the actual leaders of the community. We have this one in Rio in, in City of God. See that? Yeah, uh, I don't even know how to pronounce it in Portuguese, so I don't even try. But uh, it's with a family and we work with a few families that have been victims of police violence. And yeah, this is a very powerful story about a couple that lost a child, a very, I think if I remember correctly, a two-year-old child to police violence. And, and according to the police statement, uh, this was legal because the child was uh, resisting, was, you know, it was an act of resistance and it was a two year old child. So very, very, very sad story. And it was, yeah, it's also quite powerful content. And we've worked with uh, trans communities uh, all over. This is Andy uh, who worked with us in this uh, culture honors program at MIT. And, this is in Colombia in the conflict uh, context uh, again, uh, and it was part of a um, camp uh, that where people try to develop strategies for the peace agreement. And uh, again, people from different sides of the conflict got together and developed this story, Victimario it's called. And uh, it's also quite a powerful story. Again, it's a fiction that was uh, created based on their own experiences. This is what you see. So far, you can see the video on, on Vimeo. It's, it's, a, it's a very, it was I mean, just a beautiful, charismatic man and talking about his life. And what was interesting here is that back then people didn't know what we were doing. It really seemed like very high tech or something uh, out of this world. And, and they didn't expect that there was a performer there sitting in the room. They thought it was somehow uh, CGI created like very high tech they didn't expect that there was actually this person in the room that was following their own movements and when at some point we opened the curtain and they face themselves as you see in the image and uh, this then they remove the headsets and they have this opportunity to to talk to share which is what we try to do uh, usually in the streets of Bethlehem in Palestine and many other projects that we have done but I think I close here and thank you very much. I hope this was tolerable and I open the table for questions. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Thank you so much, Marte. That was totally amazing. Um, I just would, would like to just start by sort of asking questions that reminds, it makes me think of like Sontag's 
regarding the pain of others and how photography, we become numb to it once we become really familiar with our bodies. That's through vision, really. We can become numb to the to trauma or, mm. or what's happening to the other and keeps us somehow separate. And I'm wondering, this one tries to draw people into actual experience and and then experience possibly, I think it seems important, the thing about like the user and the guide, the performer and the, like that relationship is very, seems cr like really crucial. So I'm just wondering what you think about in terms of um, like, once people get over the fact that it's new technology, will we will still have, how, yeah, the resonance of that impact. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot in your comment. I think the first thing about vision, I do agree, and, and we do rely a lot on vision on this project, which is something I would like to get away from. There's this tyranny of vision, and I do think that vision has this objectifying capacity that other senses do not necessarily, or not at the same level. And then, um, yeah, as we move uh, from this technology being a novelty, uh, I think the most interesting things will start happening because right now, and for a few years already, it feels like almost like a gold mine. Like people have to want to find the next thing and they're using VR for the sake of VR. And this, I don't think is going to result in very meaningful content. I, I'm sure there will be exceptions or there are. But, and this relationship, I mean, I think that's a very um, sensitive, I that you have because it's true and I think even for us it took a while to realize the importance of this relationship between between the whole constellation that that emerges in the in the performance and how this is probably the most meaningful and important part and you don't need any screen for this and it's really crazy how sometimes you know we have a beautiful experience and people are so touched and crying and then we had one event i remember in in berlin with an artist that was just so so touched and then he wanted to try again and afterwards we were very stressed because there was like something was not happening and we were fighting with each other in the team and then he he told us like yeah it's you you know the, the magic is what you you know this offering that you give uh, to one person three people working together to offer this experience to one person yeah and then then there's the question of it where is the art maybe that there's art in science like how those things um mm. cross we have um a, one question that's been written can you see it in the q a you're welcome to i can help you um sort through them. And then I would like to encourage people to raise hands. And we have someone that's just raised their hand. So great. Mm. Oh, great. That's a, should I go ahead and answer that question? Sure, if you want. I know there is a recent study, like from the past few months that was done in this setting, like using it for police training. And we try to do some police training ourselves in, in Brazil. And uh, I think it's starting to be used. There are plans to use it. Uh, we are also talking to a, a Swiss politician. She's a very interesting person. Uh, one of the first, if not the first, if I'm correct, like uh, black politicians in Switzerland. And uh, she's exactly working on this. So we hope to go somewhere. And there's, of course, a lot of racial profiling all over the place. And, and this, I think this is definitely a tool for that. I hope this answers the question. Oh, there we go. Hey, um, I just wanted to say, first of all, that um, that was a lot, a lot of what y'all are doing is really beautiful. I, I love this idea of simulating socialized experiences and expressing like these dynamics of um, structural oppression or, or other things like that. Um, but I was wondering specifically, um, maybe this is uh, a concern of, of some sort, but um, do you think that this body swapping um, in regards to gender um, is maybe potentially reinforcing bioessentialist ideas of gender? And are you taking steps to prevent conflating sex and gender or a heteronormative and binary experience? Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you, Ian. Um, I mean, I, I understand that this uh, concern that that of course we've discussed and especially in this gender swap video that is you know it seems to be a very binary 
approach and and this is not at all what we think of it it's really the people that try it on that define the gender aspect and in fact we have been trying to shift the idea of gender because it's really about the identity at large this project and and think of uh, this as a body swap rather but what is interesting is that it doesn't people want to call it gender so even when we go get invited to exhibitions they they want to show the body swap i mean the gender swap and we say eh, maybe body swap because it's a brother and they like this and i understand no it's a i mean in a way it's a hot topic as well but uh, what is interesting about this video is that we it was not intended to be seen by so many people and it's our content that became viral and that gave us a place in the world and, and allowed us to continue with this project but we did it basically it was a quick and dirty video that we did for applying to an art residency that actually we got rejected from and the video stayed on on vimeo for for a while until somebody from i think wired magazine or something like this discovered it and from there it just exploded and a lot of people started seeing it um, but i understand the the concern and I mean, my take is that it's really about the two people that are sharing and it's, yeah, that, that would be my answer. Yeah, that makes and sense. Perhaps I have a, another uh, something to add that it is true that in science, because I work uh, on this, this is say my art project will our, hours, but I also have a scientific practice and there it's much more difficult to not fall into very normative ideas of gender like the other study that i mentioned the where with the sweat female and male sweat this was very difficult to go around and even uh, i mean the thing with quantifying of course is that you have to make divisions right and uh, it is it is really a challenge i think much more in science than in in art to break these boundaries and they're very robust institutions that I think, yeah, some of them do their best, but I think it's really difficult. Still, there's a large way forward. Yeah, we seem to really like to create binaries or like dualities um, as humans, but possibly with this like narrative or performance um, aspect of y'all's um, science, like, and, and um, you could maybe even combine things like, like what you're saying with the um, sense and gender and uh, sex specifically, because that's sex, right? Um, you could add a narrative of um, gender on top of that or kind of like swap the way that our brains um, conflate these things um, in our bodies. But anyways, I, I really appreciated um, you being here. It was really interesting. It made me think about a lot of things. So I appreciate it. Well, thank you. And uh, yeah, thanks for the comment. I think it's it's important that we address these things. Thank you. Um, Raina, I think, is next. Did that work? Am I unmuted? Okay. Um, so I'm trying to think how to phrase this. I think a lot of um, what you were talking about, like um, creating a sense of oneness between people and like a physical sense of oneness make, made me think of um, kind of, it's like a spiritual enlightenment that I think we have been able to reach through more spiritual methods before. And it's almost like you've created a, a, a replicable um, sense of oneness, which I'm really interested in. And I'm just wondering, um, since I think for a lot of history, there's been this kind of search for oneness, or um, I think that's a lot what falling in love can feel like sometimes is this like intense oneness with another person. And I'm just wondering about since it's so um, such a fleeting experience that you've created, like the sense of loss that comes after that. Um, have you found that that happens that um, people kind of crave to um, even be um, in the in the body swap again with someone? Is that something that you felt? Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, for me, definitely, but of course I am biased, but I do like to do it regularly. It, it, it offers this other rhythm by necessity because you have to move slowly also to be able to synchronize your movements. And uh, well, the whole thing, the whole setting 
uh, it's like a shortcut to bring me at least into a very different uh, state of consciousness and I don't think it's the only way and of course it's just a, an, another resource and not more important than the ones we have had for millennia in fact I think the others are more important but uh, definitely some people like would like to do it again it is also true that some people feel overwhelmed it's you know it's quite a something it's disorienting as well especially the first time in my opinion the second time that people do it is when we are able to convey the the intention more because the first time it's a little bit too much for it's just confusing you do you are like okay i'm there but i'm here and then we open the curtain and then you see yourself there and you shake hands with yourself and you hug yourself and you're like what what's going on it's just too much so yeah uh, the problem though is that and this is an economic problem, unfortunately, that uh, we have limited resources, no? and uh, there is not always the opportunity when we present in events, in festivals, often there are lines, there are queues, we have time slots. But when we do it in, a, in the ideal setting, I think doing it twice would be best. And, and people are welcome to come to our studio and visit and try it on. No? But um, yeah, I, I think... It's not a res it's just another uh, project and this is what we developed with the skills that we have, but it's by no means a substitution to all the other ways for feeling this sense of oneness. And I think it's a matter of diet. Just doing this once, I don't think is going to change anything, but hopefully shift some ideas, preconceptions and, and lead us in the direction. But I think if we don't, do things on a more regular basis there isn't much change going to happen thank you so much sure hello all right i think i'm unmuted there yes yeah i had a couple of quick questions so uh this is you know i think this is really cool you know Thanks. like the whole idea of being able to like change the aspect of like identity and figuring out like who you are and like discovering like what that really means. How would the, now this kind of like leads me onto my question here. How would the usage and development of new technologies like augmented and mixed reality influence the way in which the another lab is designed and with how future projects are scaled? Thanks. Um... I mean, that's a good question. And I don't hear, think I have, a, what I'll say is we have different opinions in the team. And we try to have a horizontal structure. So, you know, everyone's voice is equally important, but uh, I think there are people that would like to scale it more, you know, to a more uh, consumer scale. But uh, some of us like more the performative part, the situated aspect that it's in a place with other people and that it's not something you can try, you know, hidden in your cave, but it's something that you have to sort of do with others. And not that the other part is necessarily wrong, but I do think that we need more experiences like this uh, rather than less. So um, it's about technology. I think there's a lot of potential and possibilities and of course, no more resolution and so on. But what is interesting for me is that I almost like the quality more of the early versions of these, you know, with all the flickering and this uh, analog content that was remote transmitted and it just looked like, like, I don't know, this strange reality. And I do like that quality of it as well. So uh, while getting a better resolution might come closer to what it is to be another, it does lose a certain quality of this performance. So I, I think we're, we're going with the... <laughs> With the flow and seeing how things develop we're an independent group and we are a non-for-profit uh, organization so uh, i i don't know how things will develop but definitely interesting things happening tech wise however i must say that the tech at least for me is not the most interesting or relevant part of our project it's actually right, something you, you could have done for the past 50 years you know or, or 30 years it's not really a a big tech novelty. But yeah, thanks for your question and for the interesting, nice comments. Hello. Hello. Um, wait, is it, uh, sorry, Mike, were you done asking questions? Sorry, I don't want to jump in if you were. 
Uh, yeah, I was. All right. All right. Well, hello. Thank you for doing the presentation. There's some really cool stuff and really cool ideas and ways to go about it. Uh, my question was, so you were talking about how you would um, like do the tapping to have like the sound and like the, the delay of the sound to impact that. I was wondering if you were planning on like using more things involving other senses besides just visuals. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I think other senses are almost more interesting than vision, but you can do interesting things combining with vision because I think vision does have a impact our reality a lot. So for example, when you, if you do a body swap and, and you see that you're drinking wine, let's say, but you actually drink Coke because you're seeing from the other person's perspective and you swap these, this creates this, you know, expectation that you're going to taste something and the, this mismatch creates an, a whole different flavor even, you know? So that's interesting in terms of, uh, I, I do, I am very interested about um, um, olfaction and taste, gustation, but I am also very interested about sound and we explore the, some things with the voice, for example, the possibility of embodying another person's voice. And this was, I mean, for me, it's very beautiful. I have my whole art practice around the voice and the idea that the voice is another limb and that we're, when we are conversing, we're dancing with each other. If we think of the voice in this way and thinking on the voice as a body moving rather than only linguistic content, but uh, on like listening and feeling the nuances, the paralinguistic nuances of the voice is something that I'm very interested in. So I, I'm hoping that I can explore more of these ideas, but um, yeah, I mean, definitely we have interest. However, it is true that uh, again, we go back to the part that the thing that gets more attention is the vision, no, and gender, like there are these hot topics that these are the ones that either we get funding for or we get interest from exhibitions for and so on. But there is a lot of interest and there are a lot of interesting things with sound that um, you might want to explore. And I, I want to say also to everyone, if anyone has more questions and wants to get in touch, you can write at beanotherlab at gmail.com and you can just uh, send an email and we'll be happy to respond. Also, uh, how many people are a part of the team? Um, that's a good question. I don't even know because we come and go and then for some years, some people are not so active and some people are more active, but I would say around 10. I hope that's a good enough answer. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Can I, I just want to interrupt. We have a lot of questions. We've got written questions. We've got more hands up, but I wanted to ask you just to briefly address the um, question of science and art and thinking and because they are often placed on a kind of binary themselves. And when you said that you found that sort of preceding technologies maybe were more effective, I mean, I don't mean to be directly comparing them, but to, to, to for if you just for a minute would address like, what's the difference between art and science and how are they working interdisciplinarily? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I guess my very general take would be that science is more quantitative uh, because I think what we care about in art, at least I care about is more about the people experience the experience of people i don't care about the outcome so much or about having a measurable output and i guess there is also this other part of the artistic practice that is shared in science but perhaps not so openly which is the process and the process of creation and the content creation and the i, I guess perhaps all of us here know how it is to just go with the flow when you're in a creative process and of course they are shared, but I think art puts it more in the foreground, I guess, and science in science, it's more in the background. And there aren't so clear boundaries as we mentioned, no, in, in art, we don't care so much about the definitions perhaps. And um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think for me, they are very overlapping and both are ways of knowing that only combined can give us a better assessment of life because I think science is not good enough, at least when 
looking at these things, no human experience. Thanks. Should, should I answer the questions on the on the text like really quickly? If you would like to, yeah, that'd be fine. So the first one about the autism spectrum, I would, there is some interest from some researchers. I would be, I would really hope that it works, but I'm not very certain in, in terms of the body swap. I think there might be other tools in terms of augmented realities that might help for recognizing emotions, but the body swap, I am curious. Some people argue that theoretically it should work, some people not. I don't know, I really don't know, but I hope uh, someday we get a chance to uh, explore that. And then I will go quickly because I know we don't have that much time. I am worried about the other side of the co coin indeed. And we have had direct questions, for example, by companies that they want to use our tool for empathy as a tool for persuasion, no? And this is definitely a problem. And there is a lot of, I mean, even torture. And there is an interesting interview that we had like five years ago, but also an interesting paper on the ethics of VR that explored these possibilities uh, very thoughtfully. And I am worried, of course, actually, this is where this technology developed even. No? Um, so yeah, it is uh, uh, something that is there. That's why I think technology is not born in a vacuum. And it's really important to accompany these experiences by something else. If we just think an app will solve all the world's problems, I think we are mistaken. And then the next one I haven't read. Oh, mental illness. Um, yeah, that's a, I mean, the, some of these tools have been used for treatment, uh, but, uh, and we had uh, some worries sometimes when, especially when we do these things in science, we need like, you know, all the ethical approval and all the, you know, people have to sign the consent and everything to participate in a study. And, and usually, we do not work with clinical populations uh, and we make very sure that this doesn't happen unless we're doing a clinical study and then we have to really have supervision by an expert and so on but when we do it in art we are much more flexible and i have to say that of i don't know how many hundreds of body swaps that i have performed myself because we also perform we do all the, this touch and all this interaction i i would count i would say i had only two experiences that were not positive and this may have done uh, i think it wasn't necessarily related to this it may have been related to another type of trauma or feeling uncomfortable or feeling dizzy but that's a uh, yeah we haven't had knowledge of our experience affecting severely anyone i hope this answers the question um, but there is potential of course for for mental illness, as I mentioned, the case of depression, but many others. And you could swap bodies with a cat, theoretically, I guess, but the cat wouldn't probably have these uh, um, patients to move in a slow way. I mean, if you do CGI computer generated, then probably yes, but with a real cat, there are some, we have tried it actually with a bunny, but then you just see like movement and crazy feed, uh, like vision. And uh, yeah, therapies in psychopathy definitely have the potential. And even couple therapy, I think, for me, is something interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. It's um, amazing. I wish we could have you here in person and actually do some body swaps. It would mm -hmm. be so um, lovely, but maybe in the future when we're in a different time period. Yeah, I would love that. Thank you so much for the invitation. And I think we're a bit over time, right? No, it's just time, but so we're ending. So, okay, great. Well, thank you again. Thank you so much, everyone. And feel free to get in touch at any point if you have more questions.